Call the meeting to order. Roll call, please. Councilman DeCizio? Councilwoman Guevara? Here. Councilwoman Mendoza? Councilman Nowakowski? Councilwoman Pastor? Here. Councilwoman Stark? Here. Vice Mayor Waring? Here. Mayor Williams? Here. Uh, Councilman DeCizio is here. Oh, Mendoza too. Okay, uh, next is citizens comments. Do we have cards? Each citizen will have up to three minutes. And we have a total of 15 minutes. Anyone who isn't able to speak during this period at the end of our meeting, we will also uh, have citizen comments. Elizabeth Mann. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, mayor, city manager, city attorney, city council, and all participants to this council meeting. In 1996, like many of you here today, with a zoning case application, I was here presenting a zoning application to build a 26 acres site, including a one eight acres Chinese cultural center. City proved my zoning application but demanded I include the public art into this development, using the guideline adopted by City Council meeting on March 16, 1988. In 1997, I developed the 26 acres site with its 8.3 acres Chinese Cultural Center per the city's approved zoning stipulation. The Chinese Cultural Center's garden and iconic roof lines met the city zoning requirement and when I applied rezoning for part of the 26 acres to include a medical center in 2001, city admitted the approval letters say that the medical center does not need any more public art because the requirement is met by Chinese Cultural Center. Today, 22 years later, I'm saddened to see that over $3 million of the public art in Chinese Cultural Center is endangered every day now by the hammer and bulldozer, by the same city council who, but the same city council would do nothing to help to stop this and who has demanded me to build it 22 years ago. I'm sad to see the poor argument the city uses in Justify its action is say the Chinese Cultural Center public art was not paid by city. That is a joke. Public art, if it's paid by city, you don't have to call it public art. I find that this argument is unbelievable, regrettable. In addition, city did pay for the public art. I had two officers went to China with me, paid by city, and one still sits here today. And, uh, helped to brought the Chinese artisans to come here. City also paid for the initial advertising on the, all the newspapers, Chinese newspapers, promoting the city's proud Chinatown 22 years ago. However, I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, and our item is on 127 today. If anybody's interested, I'd like you to stay on, and we can talk in details about that. This is not about the Chinese Cultural Center. It's about the city's ability to administrate its own regulation and requirement and its public art program. Thank you very much. Uh, Charles Kahn. Honorable Council member, members, good, good afternoon. In the past several weeks, what you may not know, uh, people are using hammers to break down the public artworks, the Chinese roof in the Chinese Cultural Center. As an art lover, these actions remind me what happened during the 9-11 in New York City some 17 years ago. It also reminds me what happened during the World War I and the World War II. You see the destruction of culture and art and the people and the government systems. And this displayed in front of us today in the city of Phoenix. 
what did they destroy? With each hammer, hammering down those artworks, and not just artworks. They're destroying our faith in our government system. It is like seeing someone's being killed that you ask, please save this person, please save this person. And wherever you turn, people look the other way. This has nothing to do with me. The regulations don't do anything. And I just ask you today to think deeply about this. As far as I can understand, the city council not only can do something, but it must do something to protect the art, to protect the government the system, to enforce the laws and the rules in the books, and to stop the destruction of artworks at the Chinese Culture Center. Thank you very much. Thank you. Zach Morgan. Well, good afternoon. My name is Reverend Zach Morgan, and I'm a pastor at Apologia Church. It's an honor to stand before you, and I come again in a spirit of humility. Very much appreciate your time and attention as I bring to you again an issue that really has no parallel in its importance and need for your immediate action. As a simple Christian, it's my God-given responsibility to address my city's civil magistrates concerning issues of grave importance. All throughout history, men and women much greater than I have stood before governing bodies to compel them to interpose on behalf of those who are being abused and oppressed. One such man was our sixth president, John Quincy Adams. Adams tirelessly urged Congress to totally abolish slavery in our nation. Adams was so incredibly persistent that they nicknamed, nicknamed him the hellhound of abolition. Congress at that time was pro-slavery and grew weary of Adams' insistent pressure. So they tried to enact a gag rule banning any introduction of any petition addressing the abolition of slavery. Thankfully, they failed and Adams continued to urge Congress to abolish the horrific evil of slavery. Adams died suddenly in 1848 and sadly didn't see the fruit of his labor when slavery was finally abolished in 1865. Why did Adams wage such a war against slavery? Well, according to Adams, his motivation came directly from God's word in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. This is Jesus speaking. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. He was motivated by love for God and love for his neighbor, exemplified in the life of Jesus Christ. African American men and women and children were horribly and justifiably abused and oppressed. It was common thought in the nation at that time that African Americans were less than human, which worked to quote unquote legitimize the atrocities perpetrated against them. If a society dehumanizes a particular people group, then as history tells us, that people group will suffer horribly. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a similar situation, situation happening in our city that requires us to act and interpose in the likes of John Quincy Adams. A people group is being oppressed and murdered and by and large without any contest from our city's inhabitants or their leaders. Abortion is what I'm talking about. 1,200 innocent human Preborn beings are developing the wombs in their mothers are systematically executed every single month in our state. As you go about your daily activities and responsibilities, 40 precious lives end brutally. Abortion is murder. You may not see it that way, but this is what God's word and law says. God's law commands every single one of us not to murder, and we will be accountable to that standard on the day we stand before him in judgment. According to Arizona Statute 133603, abortion is illegal in our state and punishable by law. If the resolve of John Quincy Adams inspires you to fight for the oppressed, then I would ask you to do your duty and uphold this law. I'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Diane Barker. Diane Barker. Well, good afternoon, City Council, Mayor. It's good to see you. You know, some of you probably were up uh, 
rather late last night with the election. And um, just consider, I live in District 7, downtown. I see the growth. I'm happy to see downtown Phoenix grow. I remember coming here in the 70s, and it sure didn't look like what is happening today. So I'm pleased on that, but I am displeased with the tie-up of the traffic. And, uh, you know, I'm very displeased that we create more congestion and pollution. It affects the, the smallest, the most vulnerable, our children, when we have emissions coming out of these vehicles. And so I'm appealing to you and Mr. Dehoney, that's over the fire department, uh, in the fact of uh, when we have city vehicles that they do park where they're able to get other traffic when at all possible around, even having one of the persons there, you know, directing the traffic, because there was tie-ups on Roosevelt in the afternoon for two blocks, and uh, as a uh, PNP for our neighborhood, I really wanted to get out there and direct traffic. A police officer did, counseled me and said, look, he says you could get hurt. Well, I want to do it responsibly, but I'm asking you, I can't always get you right on the spot and during the time that there is a tie-up. Thank you. Thank you. Leonard Clark. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Leonard Clark, born right down the street. It's called something else now, but it was Good Sam Samaritan Hospital back in 1964. Um, I uh, am greatly concerned about what seems to be a violation of the court order of our brothers and sisters. Uh, I consider myself an ally uh, who uh, are watching the beautiful Chinese Cultural Center being destroyed. It looks like uh, not minor repairs are being done, but the tearing down of artifacts, things that are dear to the hearts of our Chinese American brothers and sisters and all of us who want to build a culture and a, a civility in the city of Phoenix. So that's my first concern. The second one is the city of Flagstaff passed, or they're working on a global climate change plan. Um, now, you can correct me. I know we have subcommittees, and I hope I am wrong. Um, but I, I was looking online on our website. It looks like our plan is from 2009. And I think we do owe it you know, not just to ourselves as adults, because a lot of us, I'm not saying you, have messed up things a lot for our young people, because in, I believe the scientists, the majority of scientists who say in approximately 12 years, if we don't turn the temperature, the runaway temperature around, if it goes above two degrees, we're gonna have famine, we're gonna have a lot of horrible things happening, and Phoenix is not gonna be immune from that. And you're already trying to do things by working with Tucson, by storing water, but we're already talking about increasing water rates, the former mayor worked on that, and uh, I'm just highly concerned with global climate change because I believe the scientists. I wish I was just a wild-eyed radical up here saying the world's going to end, and you know, everybody says that's not true, but thousands of scientists are saying we have a civilization-ending uh, crisis coming up on us. And even if you're a conservative, to my good conservative friends, what is wrong with having insurance for your progeny's sake, for your children and your grandchildren? Um, it's not going to be, it's going to be very, very horrible if global, global climate change, if it succeeds. We've already had a success. We've been able to, uh, I guess they're repairing the hole up in the atmosphere of the earth. Uh, that it worked. The United Nations working together with all the nations of the world. We've done something. We can turn global climate change around. The president is not right. Global climate change exists. Thousands of scientists are right. Right, not a few scientists paid by Exxon or Val, you know, Chevron saying it doesn't exist. And even if they are wrong, I hope they're wrong. Have an insurance policy. City of Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the United States of America, so I hope you'll do that. And then quickly, I'm running out of time. I am not anti-police, I'm pro-justice. This is for the good police who wanna do their job, but we need a citizen oversight commission with subpoena powers. We are one of the last major cities to not have that. Why not have that so we can all, so the, the trust of the citizens, the police, everybody, we can work together rather than what we have, an out-of-control, militarized police force. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mario Barajas, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Mayor. 
My name is Mario Barajas, and I'm going to be making an announcement in Spanish for those who need interpreting equipment in Spanish for Spanish speakers. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Mario Barajas. Uh, si alguien necesita el servicio de interpretación, puede fa a favor de pasar con el señor Nick, que está parado allá atrás, y le puede facilitar lo, el equipo para poder escuchar la junta de hoy en su idioma en el español. Gracias. Could you read the 24-hour paragraph, please? The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G6518 through 6528, S45071 through 45131, and resolutions 21686 through 21692. Thank you. Uh, now we go to meeting minutes. Uh, Councilwoman Pastor, did you have an opportunity to review August 29, 2018 minutes? I did, I move approval. Do we have a second? Second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, Councilwoman Guevara? Yes, Mayor, having reviewed the minutes of the September 5th formal council meeting, I moved for approval. A motion and a second for approval. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, boards and commissions? Motion to approve mayor and city council boards and commission nominations as revised. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Do we have some people here to be sworn in? I'm going to read this. I don't know if you have a copy. You do, and then as we get to the name of the office, each of you need to state what office that you're uh, going to, I think, going to be filling. Okay. Raise your right hand. I state your name. Aye. Do solemnly swear Aye. that I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that I will faithfully and impartially discharge the duties of the office of. According to the best of my ability, so help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, you are official. Thank you for serving. We are now to uh, license. Liquor license applications, do we have a motion? Move to approve items four through 21, except item 20, which has been withdrawn, and item 21, which is recommended for disapproval. Do I have a second? Second.
roll call. Decisio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Mayor Williams? Yes. It's unanimous. Um, item 21. Do we need a motion on that? Is for disapproval. Is disapproval. Was, that, was um, that included or? It's Banya. It's in Banya's district. Yes, yeah, item 20. I mean, or 21. 21. Oh, yeah. Um, I would like to hear staff report as well as police's report on that item, please. Well, we have a detective gold call? Okay. I'm Detective Gokul. On behalf of the uh, Phoenix Police Department, Cactus Park Precinct, uh, we recommend denial for the Series 10 uh, liquor license for the TNC convenience store located at 4812 North 35th Avenue. Uh, the applicant, Mr. Simo Barada, um, basically found through my course of investigation, he is not reliable, capable, or qualified to receive this liquor application for the following reasons. Um, the, uh, the fact of hidden ownership related to the business, criminal activity taking place at the business, such as sales of dangerous drugs, possession of dangerous drugs, possession of drug paraphernalia, and illegal sales of uh, tobacco. Uh, during the application background investigation, I determined that Mr. Barada, uh, who works downtown at a prominent uh, banking institute, works six to, se six to seven days a week, and said that the venture into the TNC convenience store was a uh, investment and that uh, he, he planned on using that as a uh, something for in the future when he does retire. And so I asked him in the meantime, uh, who would be running the business, who would be conducting day-to-day -day operations? He stated that his mother and father would. But then I asked him, who is in, has he ever been to the store? Has he seen what's inside the store? He said he hasn't been there recently because of his uh, heavy work schedule. So I decided to take upon myself to go out to the store, contact his mother and father, his father being Khalid Barada, and his mother, I apologize if I butcher the name, uh, Kadui Ganem, who were working an, in the store at that time. Uh, they both stated that they managed the store in his absence and they took care of day-to-day -day operation. While inside the store, I noticed, uh, even though it was labeled convenience store, many of the items uh, on display did not have a price tag, were covered in dust, and it appeared more, more so of a uh, tobacco shop because they had uh, several tobacco supplies, uh, cigarettes on display. And so I asked uh, uh, Khalid, who was working at the time, um, about the cigarettes that were on display, because I noticed that some of the cigarettes he had on display did not have a uh, stamp, which is required to sell for sales. And he, he in turn told me that half of them he sold and the other half were his for personal use, which I told him that you're not allowed to do. And so I did, decided to conduct a criminal background check on Khalid and uh, uh, Kadui, and found out that Khalid had been arrested before, back in 2014, 2016, at a tobacco shop at 27th Avenue and Bethany Hall Road for related to sales of illegal, dangerous drugs, spice, synthetic marijuana, 2016 at 19th Avenue in Peoria, again, related to the sales of dangerous drugs, spice. And then at this day, he actually had an outstanding warrant related to that 2016 uh, arrest and search warrant. So I went back and contacted uh, Khalid and informed him, hey, you're gonna be placed under arrest in, relationship, in relation to your, your outstanding felony warrant. Uh, at that time, once I placed him under arrest, and ended up finding over $1,900 in cash and several different denominations inside of his pocket. And basically, behind the counter, I saw within a cigarette loader uh, what appeared to be spice inside that, that, that loader. He later admitted that that's what it was. It was spice, but he stated that was for personal use. We ended up writing a search warrant um, for the business and ended up recovering ledgers, uh, paraphernalia, and several ounces of spice uh, inside of the store. Uh, during that time, he had also admitted, he and his wife admitted to the sale of single cigarettes uh, and spice to, to subjects in the area. So we have a major problem with, with drugs in that area and stated that someone would come in in exchange for cash and buy a single cigarette. And at, at, at the end of that search warrant, we ended up booking him. Uh, unfortunately, due to medical circumstances, he was released. 
I ended up running him, this is about 30 days later, about last week, uh, November 1st, I determined he still had that outstanding warrant related to the sales of dangerous drugs. Went back, recontacted him inside of the business and placed him under arrest. Uh, after placing him under arrest, we ended up finding spice in his pockets, he admitted which was, was his for personal use. We ended up writing a second search warrant and recovering paraphernalia, uh, large amounts of cash, which he stated was what he used to pay for rent. Unfortunately, we already talked to the owner who stated he already paid rent the day before. And so because of those reasons, those facts, I believe that Simo Barada should not and should never be a, uh, issued a, a liquor license in the city of Phoenix because he's doing a big disservice to the community and the citizens of the city of Phoenix. Thank you. We also have a card. Lori Fitzhugh. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I just want to take a pause how wonderful it is that we're here in the United States and having that exciting day yesterday that we're all here conducting business and participating in our civic life. What a blessing that is. I'm uh, representing, I'm Laurie Fitzhugh, and I'm the designated spokesperson for the Sevilla Neighborhood Association. We have an address of PO Box 11153, Phoenix, Arizona 85061. We became re registered with the city in September of 1993. We are within one mile of this proposed location. Our boundaries, for those of you who might not know, are 35th Avenue west to 43rd Avenue, Camelback Road north to Bethany. We are protesting as to person and location of this license. We are concerned about the oversaturation of liquor licenses. We believe our neighborhood is more than amply served. This indeed would be a new license. And in our own uh, review of public records, we have determined this applicant is not only unreliable, but indeed based on the testimony of the police department, he is harmful, actually harmful to our neighborhood. We have seen this business suite, which is 800 square feet, being identified as a smoke shop based on the banners, the swooper flags, it's all about advertising tobacco. And Sevilla Neighborhood Association and our other uh, sister associations, we always advocate to protect our children and students in the area and really limit their access to tobacco, vaping, vaping products, and alcohol. We think this is very important. We are within the Canyon Corridor redevelopment area, and I know everyone on this council is aware of the huge investment that has been made by Grand Canyon Education, Inc., and with other partners that are coming into the area, we are on the upswing. It's so wonderful, and we deeply appreciate it. We believe this application be very counterintuitive to that goal. This proposed location is within an eighth up, of, pardon could me? Could you wrap up, please? Okay, thank you. Um, this is very close to GCU and Alhambra High School where there's 2,800 students and Salido Park. We're asking you to support recommending disapproval of this application. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Councilwoman, do you have a motion? Yes, may I ask if, is the applicant present? I move for disapproval of item 21 based on the police department recommendation for disapproval on neighborhood protest. Second. Motion and a second. Uh, roll call, please. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Mary Williams? Yes. I believe that's unanimous. Uh, takes us to ordinances, resolution, new businesses. Do we have a motion? All right, ma'am. I move a uh, motion to approve items 22 to 127, except the following. Item 33, 40, 41, 65, 74, 75, 79, 100, 119, 120, 121, 122, 123, 126, and 127, item 143, or excuse me, item 43 has been withdrawn. Item 118 is gonna be continued till November 14th, 2018. And items 124 and 125 are being continued to December 5th, 2018. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Roll second. call. 
Decisio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Mayor Williams? Yes, unanimous. Brings us to item 33. Can you do 33? I move item 33. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Roll call. Decisio? 33. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? No. Williams? Yes, seven to one. Uh, item 40? Item 40, please move item 40. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Decisio? When we, um, when we dis discussed this, we were gonna put all options on the table. This only talks about going to the bond direction. If we could have them explore all options. For They're funding. gonna bring it back to a workshop. Pardon well, me? They're gonna bring, gather all the information Bring it back to a workshop in December, I don't remember the date, uh, for inclusion of everything so we could talk about how to go forward. But the way it's written, it just says to bond. Well, you're right. So it's an error. If it's an error, I get it. I, I, it's going to be all inclusive. That is a potential. Well, do you mind if I just put a friendly motion and have all options on the table? That's okay. I mean, I, if you could just do it. Mayor Councilman Zizio, just to clarify, you're talking about all funding options for public safety facilities, yeah. that's what you're referring to? Mm -hmm. In addition to bonds, other things? Right, and then if I could add one more thing, is that we also come back with a manpower need for public safety so that we combine the two and we see how the two work together. To do what? That, that's fine. Combine it with a manpower need. So you're, what you're doing is, you're, and we had this discussion, similar discussion that when you're going to be putting out a capital outlay, you've got to know what you're, you're building to. Exactly. No, and you're right. Yeah, that, well. That already worked part, part of that information up, but is, hopefully this will be tied to it. Is it? So it'll be all tied together. So we, we, what I don't want to have is have a capital discussion when you, we don't even have a manpower discussion with a funding of manpower, too. I mean, something in there. You see what I'm saying, Ed? Yes. We I have mean, to have everything. You have to be able to I, see the whole picture. Yes. Does that Mayor, make sense? Mayor Councilman, understanding this, the, the, any discussion of facilities will also tie staffing needs to those facilities so that you have the complete picture of what a fire station okay. or a police station would, would mean, both capital and operating. That's fair. And then so if we could have a friendly motion or a friendly amendment, I guess, from the maker of the motion that says that we're going to be looking at all options on the table. Agree. Okay. I don't know who did the second. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Mayor. Really? And in the second agreed? Yes. Okay. Roll call. Decisio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Item 41. Waring, can you move that one? <laughs> I'll move item 41. <laughs> You'll move it for approval? I mean, I'll, for discussion. Oh, and I'll second it. Um, we do have one card. Would you like to have the card first? I think it's Mayor Price. Sorry. Thank you, Mayor Williams. Uh, my name is Mayor Christian Price. I'm the uh, mayor of the city of Maricopa, uh, also the uh, current president of the Arizona League of Cities and Towns. I appreciate the opportunity to come before you today um, uh, as your neighbor, and uh, I see that this small little suburb of Phoenix is a, you know, a suburb of Maricopa, so we appreciate you letting me be here this morning. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, do a lot of work in my all of one month of uh, being president of this league, and I've had the opportunity to speak to many of you, and, and I know where you stand on a lot of these subjects, but uh, I just wanted to come before you today and, and uh, lay out a few things. 
While you get ready to make this decision, I, I come before you as an elected official. I understand how difficult it is to make the decisions necessary to justify and quantify relationships as well as uh, the progress and the proceeds that it gives us. And while an intangible is often difficult to explain, uh, I think that the tangibles and the outcomes are, are there. Um, if I had to kind of expound on some of our wins together, uh, I think there's $26 million that uh, the City of Phoenix uh, was able to lodge uh, in a savings from the residential rental tax uh, as we work together at the, at the state legislature. Construction sales tax was $35 million to the city of Phoenix. Digital goods bill was $10 million. At the end of the day, I'm a professional financial advisor. And so when I look at that rate of return, that's a pretty darn good rate of return for the dues that are paid to that. Now, at the end of the day, there are 91 cities and towns, and there are some hard decisions to make. And I appreciate Mayor Williams being at our executive session. Uh, I just want to charge you the, the, with the knowledge that uh, while I can't change everything overnight and I, I don't get to make decisions unilaterally, I am here to tell you that I'm, I'm hard charging and trying to make these uh, changes at the league that you all want, as well as all of our members want. I'm not afraid to make those decisions, and I think Mayor Williams saw that here this past Friday as we went into executive session and discussed the, the first of many changes that are coming. So again, I understand that you have hard decisions before for you. I would appreciate that uh, you keep an open mind and uh, I will be back before you. I've called all of you and I charge you with uh, the understanding when was the last time uh, a president of this league or another mayor stood before you in that fashion. So the end is not there uh, and I will be back before you uh, as we go along. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. And thank you for coming down. We appreciate your work. Do we have a motion? We, I thought we had a motion already in a second. She said for approve. discussion. She didn't oh, say. I thought it was a motion to approve. Oh, okay. To she said it's a motion. To open up, yeah. To what? To approve. To approve? And I second that. So, oh, go ahead. So we are approving the dues. That's the motion. Okay. Just making sure, because okay. I know that there so was the a number. So the motion is not to approve the dues. It's not to. So I'll make a, a substitute motion to approve the dues. Okay, do I have a second? You, you, you well, I'll, a second. I'll second. You have a second. second. Uh, roll call? Oh, wait, wait a second, Mayor. I'd like to make some comments, if oh, I could. Just okay. quick ones to Mayor Price. So just to give you a little history, though, too, the league came to me, I think, about a year or two ago because similar situation, City of Phoenix wasn't happy with what was going on with the league. I worked with city staff, city manager, to move that forward at the time. I'm not gonna be supporting you today, uh, and I'm gonna also explain you know, what occurred too. When you talked about the rental tax, the $26 million rental tax, let me give you the history on that if you don't mind. Uh, and you may have been there too. Darren, that was Darren Mitchell's bill. Um, I got calls from members of the multifamily industry at the time and they were getting threats from some cities that, hey, don't even think about it, we're building in our city again if you're gonna be supporting this. That's how it was, that's what came down. I pulled the industry leaders in with Darren, we got the bill killed. Basically, he pulled the bill, Darren Mitchell, Representative Mitchell killed the bill. That's how that came about. I didn't see anyone from the league in the room, but they may have been there somewhere. But in that meeting that we had where the bill got killed, it was the industry leaders who outlined to them at the time that uh, there were these threats that were out there and it wasn't worth it because of the economy was starting to take off and it's just the way government is sometimes. So, but I'm not gonna be supportive of this today. Thank you. And you know, I, I love your city, your town or city. How do you go, city or town? City. Uh, you've done a lot over there, uh, you really have. I mean, with that new Walmart Center and all those other businesses that you put in there, your hotel, I guess you still have planned in your locations. It's amazing what you've done in the town of Maricopa. The traffic still needs another lane, uh, somewhere coming out of there going both directions, but at the same time, it just shows you the amount of activity that's gone out there. Your water uh, hookups are hitting new record levels, and you've just got, you've done an amazing job over there. So just Mike, you know, my complete appreciation for everything you've done as a neighboring city. We see you as a neighbor, you know, but in this case here, I'm just not gonna be supportive of that, Christian. Thanks, Mayor.
Okay, but we do. Okay. Right. Okay. The I'll motion agree. is to approve. Uh, and I think it's fairly obvious that this motion is in trouble. <laughs> and I, as a council person and as being interim mayor, I will tell you I have always appreciated our relationship with the other cities. Uh, we have worked well, and I know many of our colleagues have worked well with the other cities too. But I know it's very obvious that this council is very frustrated with the performance of the League of Cities and Towns. Not the other cities, but the organization's performance. Time and time again, the League staff has worked against our interests without consulting or involving us. They are proven ineffective on several key issues that have affected us in meaningful ways. As stewards of public dollars, we have to be very responsible, and I cannot justify paying dues to an organization that has been ineffective for Phoenix taxpayers. I will say I hope we are open to paying these future dues in the future, but that can't happen until we see changes and improvement in the organization. But I look forward to working with leaders in other cities to make that happen and to continue to work towards common goals. So thank you for being here today. Roll call. Decisio? And the motion is to approve, correct? Right. So no. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? No. Nowakowski? No. Pastor? No. Stark? No. Waring? Uh, permission to explain that for a second. Um, I appreciate Mayor Price. I appreciate our conversation very much. I have been lobbied by the league in a different life, and I, I would argue uh, the city of Phoenix does not get its money's worth, frankly. Um, it's not a reflection on the personnel. I think it's just the way that some things are handled down at the legislature. I've been very frustrated with this organization for a very long time, going back more than a decade. We almost got out of it in 2012. We should have then, and I hope that we will now. So, uh, no. Okay. Uh, Williams? Oh, sorry. Uh, so, what's the count? Seven Six to one. To, seven to one? Okay. Seven to one, not. Motion fails. Mm -hmm. Do I have a, another motion? Or do we need one? The underlying motion. The under so, technically, under Robert's rules, since the substitute motion failed, we go back to the original motion. Which, which is to which disapprove, is to but okay. effectively we've already voted in that regard. Let's but, just vote but for the record, we there. have to do that, yes. Okay, it, roll call for the record. Decisio? Disapprove. Guevara? No. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. I believe it's seven to one. Item 65. 65. Move to approve item 65. Second. We have one card, Leonard Clark. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I was confusing this with item 79. Uh, this is on the... Uh, a grant. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Leonard Clark. Thank you so much. Uh, I was born right here in the city of Phoenix, right down the street at Good Samaritan Hospital. And uh, you know what? For a long time, we've really had it in for our indigenous brothers and sisters. And I don't like to use the term Native American. I'm not Native American. I'm a Heinz 57. But the thing is, the Tohono O'odham, I've watched repeatedly after, after time after time. They have helped out not only the city of Phoenix, but the surrounding communities of their great nation. Uh, ever since they had to fight so very hard to have the casinos and have the other things to improve the life of their members. They have been nothing but so uh, beneficial, so giving to the rest of the communities around us. So I, I hope you will vote yes, and I would also like to take this opportunity to say thank you so much to the Tohono O'odham uh, Nation. Uh, this does not make up for this. We still need truth and uh, reconciliation commissions. Maybe this city could start off by doing as Desmond Tutu did in South Africa to address all the things that have taken place. But in light of this, the Tohono O'odham Nation still, 
they set that aside, all of that anger and the injustice, and they are helping our community here in Phoenix, the fifth largest city in the United States of America. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any further comments? Roll call. Decisio? Yes, Mayor, just a quick comment. I, one of the very few times Leonard Clark and I would agree the TO Nation has been a very good partner to the city of Phoenix. Uh, we appreciate everything that they've done for us, and they work with us in a hand-to-hand -hand basis. Uh, it, they're great to work with, and uh, they do deserve a significant amount of uh, thanks for all the work that they do to help us. And that's true. I mean, for those of you that may not believe what occurred, um, especially when it came to the Water Settlement Act, and I know that for a lot of the younger people here, and I, I hope I'm part of that too, but what ended up happening many years ago, uh, the waters were dammed up, up further east, northeast in our state, and literally drove out an entire population, uh, even though they have what's called prior, um, oh gosh, I forgot their language, but it's called prior appropriation or something similar to that. But literally what happened is all the water was dried up, people died, people ended up moving. That's why if you look at Salt River, Gila River, and uh, Tohono no Onam Nation, they're all basically one people. Fort McDowell to a large degree as well, they're Pimas and, and with a mix of other you know, groups that are in there. But that's what occurred and it's a long history, it's not a good history, but we were able to correct that back in the 90s. Councilwoman Williams and I worked on that back in the 90s for, with the Water Settlement Act and I, I think you remember that. It was very controversial. A lot of people didn't want that to happen, but it was the right thing to do. So they've been a great partner for, you know, for, with the city of Phoenix since then. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Guevara? Oh, yes. Mendoza? Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Leave that unanimous. Item 74, public hearing is now open. We do have some cards. Staff, do you want to ex give us a quick briefing on this and then I'll take the cards. Yes, Mayor, good afternoon. Uh, this is a public hearing on the Enhanced Municipal Services District that was established at the request of the property owners in 1990. This provides enhanced services to the downtown core, which generally ranges from 7th Street uh, to 3rd Avenue, Fillmore to Harrison. The Downtown Phoenix Partnership, or DPP as they're known, has operated the district since 1990. The DPP is governed by a district board comprised of downtown property owners, <coughs> including city representation. The City Council does approve Downtown Phoenix Partnership's work plan and budget annually. And in June of 2018, the district board did approve their 2019 calendar year budget of approximately $3.9 million. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Any questions? If you could point out, oh, thank you, Mayor. Mike. Could you point out how much we fund of the overall operations and how much government as a whole, including the county, funds of the overall operations? Absolutely, uh, Mayor, Councilman DeCicio. If you have that. My pleasure, yes, I do. Of the 2019, uh, the general fund portion is $368,117. The total assessment year over year did decrease because we sold the Barrister Building and so we no longer pay that portion. Uh, we also have uh, portions that are covered by our uh, community, uh, sorry, the, excuse me, the uh, Phoenix Convention Center. And the Sports and Facility other, Fund and all that. Correct, too. and other entities. Let me give that for you. Okay, I have sure. that right here. Give me just one second. Yeah, and I apologize if it, um, Catch a blindsided nope, on that. nope. Happy to happy to do it. I have happy it right here. You do a great so, job and appreciate it. My pleasure, sir. So the uh, the city's complete annual expenditure for the program is one million two hundred eighty five thousand six hundred and forty dollars, of which the three hundred sixty eight thousand is from the general fund, five hundred thirty nine thousand seven hundred ninety eight dollars from the enterprise fund of the convention center, and one hundred twenty eight thousand six hundred seven dollars from the sports facilities fund. Uh, for the bio campus, $8,983 from the Genomics Facilities Operation and Maintenance Fund, and then $240,135 is collected from tenants on city-owned properties, 
and then an additional $841,323 is not the city's portion, but collected from other governments. So the bottom line is we are the funding source for that. I mean, if you do the math on that, I didn't, but it seemed to come up pretty close to the $1.2 million. Uh, so the City of Phoenix taxpayers are funding that, whether it comes from one fund or another, it's all taxpayer money. And so that's where the city, so I can't think of any other group that receives that much city funding. I get how we do it, I, get, I understand the model of why we, I mean, how we do it. It's just, it's getting to the point now, so these organizations really need to be able to fund themselves. And for $1.2 million, especially when the City of Phoenix is crying poverty, it's just a lot of money to go to one group to do one thing. And it just, I don't think it's equitable to the rest of the city. And especially, you know, we've talked about being short on police. We talk about being short on multiple services for when it comes to the public. And so I, I will not be supporting this. There's no way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have any other comments? Uh, we have a card, Dan Lucky. Mayor, members of the council, my name is Dan Clocky. I serve as the exec executive director of the Downtown Phoenix Partnership. Um, I'll be brief. I just want to address one point. Um, the city of Phoenix has been incredibly generous over the last few decades, supporting activities in downtown, as has the private sector, putting in billions of dollars as well. I think what's important is that um, we're starting to actually generate a lot of funds for the city now. So this past year, we uh, conducted a study, Jim Rounds, who's a, a well-known consultant, to look at what is the return on investment that the city and the county and the, and the state are getting from downtown. So this small little area of downtown is now producing over $37 million a year in, in sales taxes to the city. So we're actually starting to generate significant funds that's going for the rest of the city, parks, police, fire, libraries. And so we're happy that that's happening now. We're happy that there's been tremendous support over the years. So we see this really as a way to protect that investment. Uh, we work in the trenches every single day, making sure that all the things in the city and the downtown are working well. We work hand in hand with the police. We work hand in hand with all the property owners. We are the folks that are cleaning up the messes after the monsoons come through on a daily basis. And so we're efficient. We are robust in our responses to things that come up, and we provide, I think, a tremendous amount of value for the property owners, including the city of Phoenix. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Mayor. Councilman. Okay, I mean, I know your organization, it's basically an association is what it is, but how much have you produced? And why is it that the city of Phoenix, I mean, the city of Phoenix has been contributing this for years now, and every year we hear, hey, we're gonna do more ourselves, and we don't ever see that. So when's the weaning off occur? So what I, would, what I would say in response, Councilman DeCicio, is that we are actually doing a lot ourselves, that we're actually taking on a significant number of things the city has traditionally done. Uh, and we're very, we're very efficient at doing that. So for instance, uh, we are the ones that are planting and taking care of the trees in downtown. We, we pretty much handle all that now. So if the, the streets department had to do that, that would be a tremendous impact. We are paying for the trash cans in downtown and for the, the uh, efficient uh, uh, use of, of those trash cans in the sense of recycling and so forth. Um, we have ambassadors that are welcoming hundreds of thousands of guests. We are going out and recruiting with the CDB to attract new business to the convention center. So I think we're doing a lot of different things here that's bringing true value to the city. But you said you produced $37 million in new revenue. I mean, that's still a lot of money for a few trees and for maintenance. But outside no, 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 of that, that's for, for the city. Right, the city I goes no, the city. I understand that. So, how much have you produced as, an, as your group? In terms of what? Your group produced. How much have you? I mean, you said you produced sales tax dollars of thirty-seven million. Where is it? No, what Where I'm saying is downtown has produced that, right? And we're here to protect that investment. I'm not trying to be rude, but you're. I, this, it irritates me to know when when groups come and take credit for what other business owners are doing you know, what they've done on their own. So the bottom line is, I understand what you do. I'm not going to be supportive of this proposal. But at some point, you guys really need to wean yourself off of the taxpayer. It's just not equitable. It's not fair. Uh, you've been doing this for a lot of years. It's just time. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, we do have three more cards that say they are in favor, but did not want to speak. Has anyone changed their mind? 
silence is golden. I take it that as a no. Did you want to make a comment? Uh-huh. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, first, Indiana, can you please explain um, the downtown enhancement municipal services and really what the purpose is and why it was created? Mayor, Councilwoman uh, Pastor, the Enhanced Municipal Services District uh, basically does services above and beyond what the city itself would do in a particular area to create a, a kind of a destination vibrant area. It was created originally to help downtown. It was a, uh, to help downtown grow, to help downtown in, in through its attraction efforts. So the, the activities that they do are events, they are in ambassador programs, they're in safety and beautification. So they're a group that's put together to uh, perform services that are above and beyond what the city itself would do and funded by the, for the most part, by the property owners that are in the, in the area. So last night I happened to be downtown. I was here pretty late, uh, I think about 10 o'clock. And uh, I was walking by myself uh, le leaving a destination. Uh, what I did witness in, in walking is that uh, there were ambassadors at uh, different, uh, I guess, different corners as I was walking. So as a woman walking at 10 o'clock at night, which probably uh, the police chief would not recommend that, uh, and say, uh, go with someone else, uh, have an escort or go with a friend, um, that I felt safe enough and I felt safe because uh, I knew as I would e reach each corner or see them there asking, do you need any help? Uh, where are you walking to? And it was the ambassadors that were out at that hour. Um, and so the ambassadors, what I understand is part of this. Mayor Councilwoman Pastor, the ambassador program is probably the signature program that's provided by the Enhanced Municipal Services District. So it does put individuals on those corners as we have people at our convention centers coming down for uh, concerts or events or, or venues or others. They can provide them direction on how to get to different restaurants, how to get to parking, to give them recommendations on ways to go. So that safety that you, you mentioned is probably the, the signature most thing that the ambassadors and DPP do for the Enhanced Municipal Services District. And that's what's provided when we also have large events such as the Super Bowl, a Final Four. It's a, the per, how I interpret what the purpose is, is that it is to maintain, uh, as people are moving through downtown, is to keep that vibrancy, keep it safe, keep it clean, and, uh, um, and be able to have uh, people moving out of our city. Mayor Councilman Pastor, that is the structure of the Enhanced Municipal okay. Services District for those big events. And Mayor Councilman Pastor, I would just add to that, cleanliness, security, and the environment, the trees, the, the cooling that it brings are really an important piece of making people feel comfortable downtown, visitors being comfortable downtown, and spending money downtown, which benefits the entire city. I would just thank Mr. Clocky for the work the ambassadors have done under his leadership particularly in the feeling of safety and security and working with our police officers every day. Councilman. Mayor, as um, one of the representatives of downtown, I can tell you that when I went to St. Mary's High School and it was downtown Phoenix, people were afraid to come downtown. And now downtown is a place where people want to hang out. It's vibrant, as um, Chris Mackey would say, it's, it's hot. And people want to come downtown. We have all kinds of new restaurants from entrepreneurship going on downtown. So it's a whole new a whole new downtown. And this is because of business leaders coming together, working along with the city of Phoenix and coming up with concepts like this, where we self-police and, and help and clean and make sure that people feel safe. So when they go to a Phoenix Suns game, they go to the opera, they go to a concert, they go to the baseball game, they're here for a convention, they're here to study and and one of our universities in downtown Phoenix, that they feel comfortable and they feel that they can walk around safely and that if you get lost, 
there's a person in an orange shirt just walking around that'll guide you. And they're the most friendliest people. And we've, we're becoming one of the friendliest cities in the country because of this program that we have. So a lot of people have come. Other um, cities have come to see our best practices. And this is one of those best practices that they take back with them to their city. So, you know, um, if you want to figure out why is downtown so activated now, I believe this is one of the reasons why and, and people feel comfortable in being downtown now. So I'm going to be supporting this. And I think that um, we need to make sure that we bring in more people. And also, they happen to be ambassadors for, for the city. So when we're bringing in individuals that want to open up a, a business or a corporation or actually build in downtown, they're one of our biggest advocates where they go out there and they, they give that hospitality and they advocate to build and bring their business into our downtown area. So I want to thank you all for your hard work and from the many events that you've created from the zombie walk to the Viva Phoenix to all from the ice skating and all that kind of stuff that we have in downtown Phoenix that makes people uh, very attractive to the movies in downtown also. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of all the different activities and, and events and, and the safety and the cleanliness. And it just, I can't stop about bragging about what you all do, so thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, I will close the public hearing. I will now entertain a motion. Uh, for the dues, 2019 dues. Move item 74. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Uh, roll call. Decisio? No. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? No. Williams? Yes. Brings us to item 79. Do I have a motion? That was 74. I thought we just did 75. 74 was a public meeting. I'm sorry, Mayor, members and council. 74 was also to approve the a resolution approving the assessment. Oh, okay. 75 is to pay our okay. share. I didn't know there were two votes. 75, do we have a motion? Move item 75. Second that. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Decisio? Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? No. Williams? Yes. Six to two. Now we will try 79. Move to approve item 79. Do I have a second? Second. All right, we do have uh, one, a Presentation from staff, and we do have cards. Would you like to tell us what you're doing? So good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, today we're bringing before you uh, the ask to purchase a long-range acoustic device for communication purposes. Next to me I have Assistant Chief Sandra Anturia and Commander Dennis Orndor, of course my boss at the end, to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Anyone have any questions or shall I go to the cards? I'll go to the cards. Sean Severn? Mayor, I have some questions. Oh, or questions. Oh, I got it. You want to ask your question now? Did you want to ask your question? Okay, Sean. Mayor and members of council. Uh, so, a couple of weeks ago, after uh, the subcommittee voted to approve sending this to, to council, I began circulating an e-petition. So I've got the results for you here. I've got copies for everyone. Same here. 
Um, many of the people who signed this petition um, oppose giving these sonic weapons to the police, but weren't able to make it today. So definitely wanted them to have the opportunity to uh, have their voice heard. Thank you. We don't need a milita militarized police force. We need a community police force. I know some of you, maybe at least one of you in particular, likes to point out when anyone's critical of the police that they're anti-police. It's not the case. You know, we're all smart enough to know that. Um, may work for you politically, but that's not the case. So when this item first appeared, I think it was this past summer in subcommittee, Chief Williams adamantly said this is not a weapon. And she was fine just saying that. She wanted you to believe that it was just a communications device, that it didn't have this deterrent to tone feature. But it does, and thankfully the community stepped up. Um, and since then, uh, this has been continued and continued and continued. So I would ask you to vote no. But for anyone who is thinking of voting yes, I would ask you before you do, at least vote to continue it again, then go to Tempe where you all can um, see how this works in person. And by that I mean have the deterrent tone based on the specifications that the police force has said, you know, we're now limiting it to up to five seconds at a certain decibel level. So based on those specifications, have the media there to verify, but let them use it on you before you just wantonly put it out to the, the, the public. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm C H I M E N E. Pause. Sorry. My name is Shemen Hawes, and I came here today taking time off work yet again to remind the Phoenix City Council that you're here to serve the people of the city of Phoenix and not the police force. I am here to state in no uncertain terms that I do not want you to send one penny on a sonic device that is meant only to deafen and disperse crowds of people. This is no way a communication device that is a lie, Chief Jerry Williams. I would also like to remind the city council that you're currently under a lawsuit, class action lawsuit, by the ACLU of Arizona for your actions when you used unreasonable force against the residents of Phoenix when they came out to greet our president with protest. It is our First Amendment right to protest our government when we are not happy with it. There is no other reason for this sonic device, AKA a sound cannon, which deafens people. There is no reason for it to be used other than to silence the public. Chief Jerry Williams, if there are enough people coming out in a crowd pissed off, maybe you ought to just listen to them instead of trying once again to silence them. The lawsuit specifically names you, ma'am, for unreasonable use of force and several of your officers. This is no time for you to be asking for money from your constituency who you are supposed to be protecting and serving for additional militarized weaponry to use against them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Please. No more money for police weaponry. Thank you. Buy some Priuses and cruise the neighborhood looking for crime. Thank you. Kate Tatania or Tataya. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Kate Tataya. Thank you for having me. I'm here to talk about the LRADs, the sonic weapons. They are horrendous. Um, I'm sure, I hope that some of you have done research on them. Um, but I wanna bring two things to your attention. Um, first of all, I think that you need to seriously be critical of the argument that the chief of police is bringing to you um, that she is using as a base to justify her request for this weapon. The events of that day, a year ago, when we were there peacefully protesting with children, might I add, um, 
against a president that is racist, that is um, very actively enacting policies that are meant to, to kill and harm and separate um, us, we showed up peacefully. And the police chief's idea, I think, that when um, she requests that protesters disperse from what is their constitutional right to gather, that request is unfounded. And even if you shout it, even if you deafen me in my ears saying that I cannot protest in that moment, I know that I have the right to be there to do that. So I think that there's a, there's a foundational a problem with the argument that's being put forth to the council for why these weapons are needed. Second, I want to say that just today I heard that J.J. Johnson, a community member, had, had uh, received the results from a public records request. And the public records request was about um, the chief of police's um, lack of a, um, uh, what's it called, a, a public uh, request for proposals, um, which the chief of police should have done. Um, she did not make a public request to a number of different companies for some machinery that would elevate her voice or her officer's voice. What she did is she specifically made a contract with LRAD. So this should prove to you that she was not looking for some device to elevate her voice. She wants this weapon. She wants the LRAD device. And I think you can assume why. Thank, Thank you. you. Leonard Clark. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, because we are the fifth largest city, or approximately fifth largest city in the United States of America, um, and because of the fact that we are one of the last major metropolitan areas in the United States of America to not have a civilian or, or some type of oversight police board. And again, I'm in the middle, so I get attacked by both sides. But the police have become militarized. That was demonstrated last year. I was there during most of that protest when uh, the president was here. So because we don't even have an oversight board, and, and I understand why you were afraid, because as a politician, it's basically political death. You've got the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association, and I have them coming after me now, giving me tickets for every little infraction, selective enforcement, this type of thing. Um, you know, we need to have accountability before we start handing over military-style weapons. And I say this be, and knowing there are officers who have given their lives and put their lives on the line. Again, see, I will get attacked by the other side. But there are other officers that shoot, quest, shoot first and ask questions later. I know this because in the military, I was in a military police unit, many, many good individuals, and some of them served here. But the thing is, you know, we need to have some type of sociological training, psychological training. The people are not the enemy. And these cannons send exactly the wrong symbol. Uh, message. Nobody's buying this. Oh, they're just for talking to the public. That is not true. We all know what their use is to be, you know, for. So anyways, it's, it's not about one side opposing the other. It's about the laws of humanity. It's about the Constitution of the United States. Whether you are a Trump supporter, you're not a Trump supporter, whether the police come after you as a Trump supporter or not as a Trump supporter with sonic cannons, with plastic bullets, you know, we need some accountability first, and we, uh, that's what I'm asking. Please vote no on this. Thank you. Thank you. Barry Hernandez. I might mention, I think Councilman DeCicio is on the phone. I am there. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, my name is Viri Hernandez. I am with Community Organization Poder en Acción. And we're here to oppose this, right? We've been opposing it since the summer that it came out, and we continue to oppose it. This is a weapon. It has been used in military, has been used in warfare, has been used as a weapon. If we want a loudspeaker, let's use a loudspeaker. Get a loudspeaker, cool. Let's get a speaker. But this is specifically used as weapon and has weapon options. And I agree, go, go get it tested on yourselves, right? Go see what this has caused. This has caused extreme pain and ripple effect for people who have had this used on them. So that's one. So even if this were free, and I think we've talked, they've talked about a grant before, even if this were, that time should have been spent figuring out how to de-escalate what is currently the deadliest police department in the country, not to continue to add weapons to do that. And finally, um, part of what happened last year with the Trump in, in the 
uh, yeah, in the protest and the police using excessive use force, I I've heard it say, well, we had this weapon, we could have used this. The thing is that there were a lot of things that the police department could have used that night, and it has been shown over and over again that there were no warnings given. So it doesn't matter what the things that they, that, you know, that they could have used this, they didn't want to use this. They didn't disperse the crowd. They didn't put warnings ahead of time. They didn't communicate with the community. And so this weapon for us is a clear attack and continuation of a culture of violence that is within the police department, a culture that has caused mistrust with the community. The community does not trust this department. And adding more weapons is going to continue to further impact and continue to further separate the community from a police department. And we're going to continue to use these weapons. So we, again, we urge you all to vote no on this. Community has come several times saying to vote no. There are other options. Find other options to get a loudspeaker. Maria Teresa Mabry. Maria, are you here? Okay. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Maria Teresa Mabry. I'm a resident of District 8. I'm a third generation Phoenician and I'm super proud to be a Phoenician. I'm proud of my city. I'm proud of my people and where we've come from. I'm proud to say that I'm gonna raise my children when I have them here in Phoenix and I am disheartened and dismayed that this is being heard once again when community comes and tells you that a militarized weapon that continues to be misnomered as a mass communications uh, tool or something that's misnomered, and I'm gonna say it plainly, somebody's saying that it's something that's not an acoustic, acoustic tool to actually produce and militarize, continue to militarize the most violent police force in the US. So I'm also an M for BL electoral justice fellow and I also think it's disheartening that this is actually being heard the day after elections when so many of our community members struggle and bust our butts to make sure that folks like you are elected to make sure that you represent us. So I hope that you hear us today. Please. And I hope that you hear that when you choose, you're making a choice for our people, when you choose to invest in a militarized weapon and invest in militarizing a police force that continues to cause so much harm to our people as a third generation Phoenician, that you are disinvesting in community, that you are disinvesting in community safety, that you are not investing in our community's futures, and yet you wanna talk about the Trump rally, there are lots of mechanisms in which community relations happen in a real tangible way. And if you wanna have a conversation, we can have that way and, and figure out what that can even look like. But that hasn't been an offer that's been set to the table. And so I'm asking you to vote no. I'm asking to vote no on the militarization of our police force and invest in community safety. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Leros. Hello, my name is Joseph Larios, born and raised here in Phoenix, Arizona, um, South Phoenix. Uh, and I agree that the lack of oversight and accountability continues to result in a lack of trust. Um, the fact that there was no public process, there was no request for proposal, um, the fact that it was continues to be housed in the department that's currently being investigated for aggressive use of force, um, these are all problematic things, and if, if the goal for the city is to continue to build trust, I don't see how this process invests in that. Um, to the contrary, investing in, in militarizing our police force continues to demonstrate that what matters is dominance and control, not trust building, not relationship building. Um, I don't see how purchasing a sound cannon um, in any way fits with community-oriented policing. Um, and so to support this is to su continue to support what has been problematic in our public safety. Um, and we continue to see that our most valuable resource is our people. And our community has continued to show up to say we are willing to invest our time and efforts to create a safe Phoenix. 
Um, yet we don't see that responded by the city of Phoenix with actual investment to build those relationships. And so we keep coming on and, and saying these things, what seems to be on deaf ears. Um, and so we're here yet again, asking you to vote no on this. Um, again, this does not build in any way a sense of trust. Um, it actually continues to further the divide that we feel um, and to further entrench the fear that continues to be on the minds and on the hearts of the people that you're called to represent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Zinia Obana. Good afternoon, members of the council. Um, my name is Zenia Arona, and I am a child of Maryville. I was present during the rally in August of last year. The action and crowd was sizable, energized and noisy, but peaceful. There was a lull in the late afternoon when the Phoenix Police Department deployed chemical weapons to the crowd. The police department did not communicate an adequate nor appropriate dispersal of the crowd, and I am an eyewitness to this. Uh, I was standing at the barricade on 2nd Avenue in Monroe and leaning over the barricade and had to strain to hear anything over the crowd. The use of weapons against peaceful civilians is within the standard procedure of Phoenix PD, so much so that we have been declared the most lethal police force in the country. The purchase of these sound cannons, a weapon which can un cause unconsciousness and rupture to eardrums, is an outsized overcorrection of the actions in August, and a threat to the community to be policed, and a threat to the trust to the Phoenix PD. I stand in opposition to the purchase of the sound cannons. I ask that you vote no, and I ask that the council extend a continuance to allow further discussion to affected communities and with affected communities. A solution can be found, but this is not it. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Turney. Good afternoon, Phoenix City Council. My name is Jennifer Tunning, and I'm urging you to vote no against this item. The, the item in question, the LRAD 500, commits sounds up to 154 decibels, which is louder than a military jet taking off. Noise-induced hearing loss, according to the National Institute of Deafness, can start at 85 decibels. This sonic weaponry can cause permanent damage. If communication is truly the goal, there are other systems that can meet this need without having the ability to cause permanent damage to citizens exercising their rights. I echo what my peers have stated today and urge you to vote no on this item. Thank you. Vatima uh, Mohammed, I don't know, Roki? I imagine I just murdered your, your name and I apologize for that. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Fatima Mohammed Rok. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, I respectfully oppose um, agenda item number 79. I concur with my peers. There are several reasons why I oppose agenda item number 79. One cost. For one of these devices, it costs between 18 to $25,000. The request is to purchase two. That's at least $50,000. My second reason for opposing is hearing loss. Um, it offers um, intense imbalance issues, rupture of eardrums, severe ear ringing, splitting headaches, vomiting, irre irreversible damage. And this is for older people, children, and young adults. This device was also used in Standing Rock there was a grandmother who reaccounted her experience of um, the device and how she has emotional trauma from the device. 
in addition to hearing loss, in addition to health issues. Adding this weapon would increase healthcare needs. It would increase the mental health service needs, and it would increase the distrust that the community has for policing in our community. Um, I would offer and suggest a more peaceful resolution, uh, an opportunity to have some community-based training and come together to have a conversation about what the community and the police department could do to better support each other. As we know, the police department also goes home and has families. So if one of the family members was in a crowd and a jet engine passed by and their child did not have protective ear covering, it could create that damage. But in a violent situation, this is, for lack of a better word, painful. Thank you. Lola. Lavisky. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Lola Levesque. I am a community-based organizer with Justice That Works, and I am also a community member of South Phoenix now for over 30 years. Um, as we all know, South Phoenix is one of the most heavily policed communities in Arizona, and I am opposed to the police force, named the most deadly police force in this country, um, increasing their arsenal of weapons to use against us as a community. I find it troubling that our co the city went out seeking grant dollars for weapons to use against the people when investment should be in building trust, should be in rebuilding the harms that the police force has caused by killing nearly 20 people this year. What message does it send to our community, to our children, when we increase destructive and harmful practices. We should be appalled that we're focusing on violent methods of engaging the community when there is zero accountability. What's happened to the police force for having shot almost 40 people this year? Nothing, there's no oversight. So when they increase their arsenal of weapons, what's going to happen to us, the community? I personally am disenfranchised. I'm not able to vote. But I went out knocking doors for people who are looking at me right now. I take my son out knocking doors. I have no other voice but to ask the city council to listen when I'm speaking to you about representing me. You represent the people, you don't represent the police. So please listen to the people. Thank you. Um, any questions to staff? Mayor, I have questions. I have a few. Uh, can I go? Thank you. Um, just for clarification, can you clarify what it means when the policy says, under no circumstances will the department take any steps to weaponize the LRAD to inflict harm upon the public? So, Mayor, members of Council, Councilman Graval, really great question. So let's first start off with the fact that we've created a policy that's really provided some stringent outlines on when and what we're going to use and not use it for. So when we say under no circumstances we're going to weaponize, there are members of our community who are coming saying that, that this is a weapon. We're taking steps in policy to make sure that that never happens. Number two, uh, there is mention also from our community members about the tones being at 150 decibels, the sound of an airplane flying over your house. We understand that. That's why we say in the policy, the tones will not go over 113 decibels. So that's what we're talking about. We've created a dynamic policy that um, some of you were here before when we went through the 4.48 discussion uh, we understand and know what we need to put in policy and what we don't in order to have uh, accountability and responsibility to our community. Thank you. And just as a follow-up, so is it fair to say that using the device at levels above 113 decibels would be considered weaponizing it? Say that one more time. If, is it, would it be fair to say that using the device at levels above 113 would be considered weaponizing it or so, so, Mayor, members of Council, Councilwoman Guevara, I would not say that, but I would speak more to the industrial hygienist or to policy. But if we say it can't go over 113 in policy, if, one, if that happens, and it shouldn't because we have 15 people who are going to be trained in it, okay. that they would suffer discipline. So I don't know if Chief Renteria wanted to answer that. And I'll, I'll refer to the industrial hygienist in just a minute, but 
even at its maximum level, it's not weaponized. So just so for some clarification, the LRAD is, it stands for long range acoustic device, and it is a highly intelligible long range, range communication system. It basically is that loudspeaker that everybody is asking for. Um, some misinformation in, out there is, you know, that I can tell you it's not a weapon, it's not a sound cannon. The LRAD is um, manufactured to limit its, its decibel level and frequency level, making it incapable of producing any sound that can inca incapacitate, disable, disorientate, or cause any kind of loss of bodily functions. Please. So I, I will also turn it over to Peter LeCheminant, who is the Save City Safety Division Industrial Hygienist that's assigned to the police department that could probably answer a little bit further. And I also want to know what would be considered weaponizing it. Yeah. Uh, Mayor, members of council, uh, as far as weaponizing, I, I don't have a specific answer to that. Um, I don't know what we would deem that definition as. Um, but for reference, uh, where we say that the LRAD would not be used above 113 decibels, that's the, the uh, intended level by the time it reaches the audience. So without getting too technical, um, as, as noise travels across a distance, it's, uh, its power, its intensity loses, um, or excuse me, loses that as it spreads out. So as, as you double the distance, so as we go from one meter to two meters and two meters to four, there's a six decibel reduction every time we double the distance. Uh, Within the policy and, and is the, uh, in the safety section uh, in HR and, and oversight of the police department, the industrial hygienist over the police department, um, it's also my obligation that, that we make sure this is used at safe levels because we most likely uh, will have officers on the other side of it. And OSHA says that we cannot expose them to hazardous levels of noise. OSHA deems that level at 140 decibels. Um, so within that, you, at about... Um, How many decibels? 140 decibels deemed by OSHA. Um, any, any instantaneous exposure to that level is deemed a uh, risk of permanent hearing loss. Um, anything below that is, is a, a calculation of, of overall exposure with the time. Um, if we were to maintain the LRAD at, at the target audience, audience receiving 113 decibels, uh, we're within a range of at least 15 minutes of exposure that OSHA deems as a safe level. Okay, and again, just going back to the question of it being, um, because the policy said, there's a line in the policy that defines it as potentially, if it's weaponized, how, you know, I, I guess I just wanna know how, how you would know when something, when it's considered used as a weapon and why that term is, why, that's, why that line is in the policy if it can't be, if it's not being defined. Yeah, how do you define it? Ms. Mayor, members of council, Councilman Guevara, in our conversations with community members and our conversations with some of the elected officials, that was one of the questions. So we wanted to make it very clear in policy that it was not going to be weaponized. We still stand behind the idea, ma'am, that this is not a weapon, but we okay. know that there is talk and discussion in the community, so we wanted it to be very clear in policy. Okay, I have a couple more questions. I'm sorry, thank you for your patience. When the policy says that uh, the misuse of the LRAD shall be subject to discipline, what would be considered misuse and what is the potential discipline that somebody would face? Please. So Ms. Mayor, members of council, Councilwoman Guevara, much like uh, other entities or other entries in our policy, if there is excessive force, if there's misuse, if you're using it against how you were trained, keeping in mind we're only gonna train 15 or so people. So this is not a device that every patrol officer is gonna have out there. It's gonna be used by our tactical response unit and used only in certain, certain circumstances and situations, keeping in mind also that this is not just a tool for dispersal, it's also a tool that we can use if we have to evacuate. It's also a tool we can use if there's an active shooter. So um, to name and, and exactly tell you what the discipline would be depends on a lot of different factors. Uh, but we are willing to identify that if someone uses this, this um, machine inappropriately, that we are going to look into it and start our review process, and if necessary, we'll discipline our employees. But I can't tell you exactly what that would look like because a, a number of factors depend on that. Okay, so using um, this device at above 113 decibels would then be considered misuse instead of and not weaponizing it? So let me 
Ms. Mayor, Councilman Guevara, let me make sure I'm hearing your question. Mm -hmm. So you're asking me that if it's used over 113, you're asking me it what's would, the rest of your question? Would it be deemed mis as misuse or as, because I'm still not clear on so, how it's so, being. So I would say misuse, failing to follow your training, failing to follow policy, failing to follow procedures, what I would okay. counter that as. And lastly, when the LRAD is used, how will the department be documenting that use and ensuring that the policy was complied with? So, Ms. Mayor, members of council, did you want to answer that, Chief Renteria? Oh, I can, okay. I can answer that. Uh, Mayor, Councilwoman uh, Guevara, um, the documentation will be uh, completed in our departmental reports or our internal um, reports. I forgot what we call them now. We used to call them de departmental reports. Um, Anytime there's any kind of uh, injury or even alleged injury, we'll be documenting it in our reports. Um, and if I so also can clarify the 113 decibel level, that is for the intended user or listener. So if somebody is a mile away, we probably will be over 113 decibels to try to reach them because they'll never be at the listener level at 113 decibel levels. You know, you, because okay. what happens is the further you're away, the lower the decibel level. So it's, it's hard to say we can never go under 113 decibel levels. So if you're on the 20th floor of City Hall and we're trying to reach you, it, we may have to turn it up a little bit louder. Okay. And going back to documentation, um, this is more of a, a comment than a question, but I think the department should really look into a separate way to report the use of this device for transparency and accountability purposes. I think it's, uh, I think some kind of report that clearly states which uh, officers use the device, what the setback di distances were, and if tones were used, uh, who approved the use, and why um, would be helpful. Thank you. Councilwoman Mendoza, did you have a question? Thank you, Mayor. Mayor. Uh, someone from the crowd, I think it was Joe, that mentioned about an RFP, not putting this out as an RFP. Can you explain why we didn't put this out in an RFP? Um, and, and Mayor and Councilwoman Mendoza, great question. So this was the one device that has already been approved by OSHA and is also used by other jurisdictions around the country. So that's the reason why we went this whole source route. Another question. Um, so can you explain to me, because I'm more of a visual person, how far does the LRAD need to be from the crowd when the alert tones go off? I think I'll turn it over to the industrial hygienist. Uh, Mayor, Councilman Mendoza, uh, that is a simple calculation of how loud the LRAD is turned up and a measure of the distance. Uh, it's a simple scientific uh, equation where once we know where the LRAD is operating at uh, and we know the distance of the crowd, we can turn it to the appropriate uh, level. So for example, uh, if the crowd is at 100 feet, uh, the maximum operating level of the LRAD can be at is 142 decibels so that by the time that 100, uh, by the time the sound has reached that crowd 100 feet away, it would be 113 decibels for the intended audience. And so when you Um, I am too. I'm trying to figure out if I'm sitting right here or standing right here, where would the LRAD be? Or opposite, if the right. LRAD's right here, how far would I be standing? Mayor Williams, uh, uh, Councilwoman, it, it, it depends. It depends on um, if the LRAD's here and you're there, I'm gonna turn it down. So that way the listener, and you guys would be the intended listeners, would be receiving it at 113 decibels, decibel level. So that's the, the difference is this isn't one set tone like our sirens on our, our police uh, cars where you can't turn it down. It just comes out at 120 decibels and that's it. Here we have the ability to turn it up and turn it down depending on the distance of our intended listener. So if our intended listener is closer, we turn it down so that way we can, we, they only receive it at 113 decibel levels. And the way we were planning on doing that is we were gonna have a range, uh, I think they call them a range finder, uh, like they use on the golf courses where you can determine the distance. 
We have the industrial hygienists here that can do the calculations that says at certain distances we have it at these levels. So that way when we're out there, we can, we can use our range finder, determine the distance, and that tells us what level of volume we should be at. So the listener is only hearing it at 113 decibel level. I, I hope I answered your question, ma'am. When it comes to documentation, who's gonna be measuring this? I mean, how are you gonna be measuring there? Can you walk me through that? How do you, yeah. So Mayor Williams, members of the council, that would be the operators, the 15 that we have trained. Uh, we would go out like Chief Renteria said, and we would have a matrix in place that says if they're this distance, um, this is the sound level or the volume level that it would be at, but it would be those operators specifically trained to utilize the LRAD. But if I come back and I ask for documentation, how are you going to present that to me? Mayor Williams, members of the council, that would go in one of our incident reports. So if there was an instance where we would document an incident report for a crime, um, then whoever was operating LRAD would be responsible for putting that information in, just like we do any other device that we use. Okay. Um, I still have some more questions. If we didn't have the LRAD, what other methods of disbursement would you use? So, Mayor, members of council, we, we would use what we have now, which was proven not to be effective during the Trump protests and rallies. So we'd use aircraft, we'd use bullhorns, we'd use our on the ground LRAD system. And after our actual, after action report was completed, that was one of the key factors that our community members mentioned is that they were not able to hear us. So um, we would have to re rely on what we currently have um, t in order to communicate with the crowd. And uh, I think it was during the Public Safety Subcommittee, you mentioned that you will also be having officers in the crowd, right? Uh, Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Mendoza, much like we did the last time, we have our community response squad yes. officers who are plain close folks who are on the ground along with our tactical response unit officers, along with those of us who are on the ground too. So it would be a, a mix of law enforcement and the community. Uh, can you tell me what is the decibel level of a fire siren, police siren, and a fire alarm? Mayor, Councilwoman Mendoza, uh, obviously between different sources, um, different manufacturers, it's gonna range, but for the most part, uh, a police uh, siren or fire siren, you're going to look at about 130 decibels. Um, the most accurate information I could find for a fire alarm is uh, the accepted standards. It needs to be 15 decibels above the area's background noise. Um, but generally that you're going to see anywhere between 95 to 130 decibels as well. Uh, 95 to 100 and? 130 depending on the area. 30, okay. Okay, thank you. Here. Councilman. So we heard in, during the um, public safety subcommittee um, some ex negative experiences in other cities, right? So what are we gonna do to make sure that it doesn't have a negative impact w within our city of Phoenix? Please. Mary Williams, members of the council, uh, that is correct. There have been some other cities uh, that were brought up in the public safety meeting. Uh, from my understanding and the research that we have done, uh, those two cities are Pittsburgh and New York City. Uh, there were two lawsuits filed in each, or I'm sorry, one lawsuit filed in each city. Pittsburgh has settled their lawsuit. Um, and from what we have learned is that neither uh, New York City nor Pittsburgh, either one of two things, they did not have the adequate training from LRAD or there was no policy in place. Uh, like I said, Pittsburgh has settled that lawsuit, but New York City is still in uh, the early stages of theirs. But it was one of those two things. Either there was no training in place or there was no policy, both of which we have addressed with our policy. Now, working at a radio station, I know there's a difference between verbal decimals and a siren decimal. Is that true or not? So the LRAD does have two features. There's the alert tone feature and the decibel feature. Uh, from the information I've seen that the, the uh, alert tone does operate at a higher level. That's where the LRAD does max out at the 149 decibels. Um, however, there have been concerns raised that even uh, no matter what the level, that the alert tone is more damaging or harmful. Um, and either way, uh, 113 decibels is 113 decibels. It doesn't matter whether it's voice or alert tone. Um, it's just how we as human ears perceive it. 
and I, I was actually at the rally myself on the opposite side of the um, Trump supporters. And one of the things that it was hard to hear, the helicopters flying over with their voice message, with the speakers that you all had and the uh, megaphones, right? So um, we asked you as a city council to look at other means and best practices out there in the community. And this is what you brought to us. Um, is this what you believe is the best um, way to communicate to a crowd of individuals? Um, so, so Mayor and Council Member Noah Kowski, this is one more tool in our tool belt in order to be able to communicate information on the fly. Uh, 425 other agencies around the country, some of them major cities, um, we've looked at practices, we've looked at mistakes that other cities have made with this same device and, and we've clarified and we've changed and made adjustments to that. So I would answer that question, sir, is this is one more tool uh, for us to use to be able to communicate with our community members with the caveat that we're just not giving it again to everyone, that there will be specifically trained employees who will have this. And as was previously mentioned, um, it's going to be documented in a department report, um, but as always, uh, anytime we have an event or an incident, there's always going to be a post brief and an after action where we review what worked and what didn't, and this would be one more thing that we'll do that with too. And then the last question would be, um, we have officers that are specialists in crowd control, and or these be the 15 individuals that are actually trained and, and on using the, the, the equipment that we're gonna be purchasing. So Mayor, Mayor uh, Council Member Nowakowski, yes, they'll be part of our tactical response unit. Councilwoman, did you have a question? I have uh, actually several questions. One thing is that in doing research over this, um, and this reminds me of uh, Calvin's LED lighting in the sense of, of decibel. Um, safe noise, and, and in safe noise, um, in, in studying, there's a chart, and it talks about noise level. And if you were exposed at 112 decibels, you can only be exposed to that for 50 seconds or else you are causing damage. Um, if you go to 115, it's 28 seconds. So what I heard from you is you have, uh, if I'm sitting here, or where, wherever I'm sitting, uh, you would have this at 113 to get used. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out, because I know exposure at 113 could damage someone's ear. I wanna know at what point do you determine or how do you determine at this decimal level you'll go, at the next decimal level you'll go, and at what point do you stop knowing that if you hit a certain point, you're gonna start damaging people's ears? Not, I, I'm just saying in general. Community, officers, everybody who's around this LRAD. Um, so I need clarity on that. I can see if you're on a, a, a building that's 20 feet high, I can see that being used at that level because it's going down into the, into the crowd or into the, the streets. I can see it at that level, but if I'm down at the ground and right there, you're going to hurt me. Not intentionally, but it's going to do so. I, I'm having, I'm struggling with at what point we so, move, you, you, so at what point is it their Pastor, direction to move? I, I'm gonna let the technical person answer that, but I think there was one key point that you mentioned, ma'am, and that key point is for 20 and 30 seconds. We're not talking about using the system for that length of time. We're talking one, two, three, five seconds with changing from voice to tones, um, but I'll let uh, Peter answer the more technical part of that question. Uh, Mayor, Councilman Pastor, members of council, um, from the standards that I follow, which uh, are underneath uh, OSHA guidelines, 
Uh, OSHA has a published table that indicates that for 110 decibels, you're allowed to be exposed for 30 minutes uh, safely, and at 115, that goes down to 15 minutes. Um, so that's where we came up with the 113 decibel level. Um, as Say well, that again, uh, at 100 and what? <clears throat> at 110 decibels, OSHA deems 30 minutes as uh, acceptable exposure. At 115, that goes down to 15 minutes. Um, and just to, to again, as, as to help visualize uh, some comparable noise levels, so uh, it, it's deemed things like a chainsaw leaf blower or snowmobile operate between 106 to 115 decibels. Um, versus a uh, rock concert or a uh, loud music event operates anywhere between 120 to 129 decibels. And, that, and that's a constant within that area, not for the brief time that we intend to use this device as quick communication. So I understand that you, OSHA, I'm looking at the sound uh, document and piece that, that, that is out, that they, people use. And so when you say 100, noise level at 113? 113 is the intended level to use the device. Okay. It says maximum exposure time per 24 hours. Uh, I have no cheaters. Uh, 28 seconds. So Mayor, members, so, you're members saying of council, so we're not talking about 28 seconds worth of use. So it's very clear in our policy that talks about two to five seconds and then voice, two to five seconds and then voice. So we're not talking, ma'am, about the constant stream of this noise. We're breaking it up in pieces. And through training, we'll make sure to better understand what that looks like when we expose our officers to it, too. So <laughs> I would like to see, and I don't know, I would like to see a table placed in here, and a table saying 112 five seconds or whatever is being told or I'm trying to articulate kind of as I'm thinking I'm trying to flush it out but I would like to see a table of saying in training of saying five seconds uh, how it works because then I think it goes back to your question as to what is deemed weaponizing because if it goes past x then you know at that moment uh yeah and they uh, violated something addition to that that my follow-up again so like i said the policy says under no circumstances will the department take any steps to weaponize the lrat to inflict harm upon the public so i just quickly uh, chief renteria it seemed earlier that you said that even at max decibels this isn't a weapon um, so to clarify, is there any use of this device that the department would consider to be weaponized? And if not, then I think that needs to be included. So, and Mayor Councilwoman uh, Gavada, uh, no, this is this is not a weapon. It cannot be weaponized. Um, in in order for it to be a weapon, it would have to be something that would be intended to cause serious physical injury or death for it to be qualified as a weapon, that this is not even manufactured that way. And then we put in policy um, specific to limit the exposure time to, um, to fall within OSHA standards on a safe deployment of decibel level. So why, I was just, why isn't that in the policy, the way you defined it? I think that's something that needs I, to I be I think we, we wanted to make it clear that the intention of the of the device is strictly for communication and not for anything other than communication, and that's Please the clarification we, we we wanted to to do. But it's um, it's actually not a weapon. So really, that line means nothing if it's not then defined. It's I'm important. Borrow, to add Mayor, that. I I would disagree with that statement. So so again, in talking to our community members and reviewing. The topics of policy, as Chief Renteria said, we just wanted to make note of the fact that this we're using this as a communications device, and that's all we will be using it for, and we're putting in policy to deem it so. But Councilwoman Stark? Just as a follow-up, wasn't one of the reasons that you wanted this sound device is so that you don't have to use other means or other tools to disperse a crowd? 
This is, this is really to help you prevent other things from happening, right? The mayor, Councilwoman Stark, that is true. So instead of uh, going to chemical agents and instead of having officers go hands on, we wanted to create some distance and create a dynamic where our community members could get accurate information on what's going on, where to go to disperse, and keep the community and the officers safer. You have another question? Oh, I don't have another question. I want to uh, make, uh, I want stuff in the policy to be very clear. And so I want weaponization defined. And so how do we go about doing that? Uh, because you're telling me that this item, this LRAD is being used as a communication tool. Mm -hmm. However, there are ways that it could be or perceived as uh, it being weaponized. And I need that clarity. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Guevara has been asking for clarity, and I keep hearing, no, we can't do it. I want to get to the win-win place <coughs> where we, uh, we can get to that place and it's very clear. So when training happens, the men and women in blue understand what the clarity is within this policy. I'm sorry. This is the council's time to ask questions. No. No. Please sit down. No, the hearing is over. This is a time for the council members to ask their questions and get answers. Mayor, is it okay if I call her up to ask a question or have her ask a question? Okay. Thank you. Um, so just the question is, so I heard it was just for communication, so that sounds like delivering a message. Um, so what kind of message would you deliver in two to five seconds? Because even just saying hi is more than that amount of seconds. Um, and then two, it was earlier I heard that there weren't going to be tones used, and I am also hearing that tones will be used within two to five seconds. So what will be the use is a question. If it is just for communication, what message will you get out in two to five seconds. Um, so that's one of the biggest questions. And also second, just clarity that what happened in the protest, it was a part of the news um, in your reports state that there was no warning officially given. So by the time that the warnings happened, there was already chaos in the community. So it wasn't that we didn't hear your messages, is that there was never a warning given to begin with. And that's in the reports that everyone, including the police department, put out to the community. So uh, Mayor and Councilman Guevara and Pastor Huesi has stepped out. So um, we could add in for the clarification purposes on not weaponizing is to put a statement in there that says a weapon is a thing designed or used for inflicting bodily harm or physical damage, so we can put that in the policy. Um, as far as what tones or what we will say, that depends on the incident. So we look at this as a way to alert our community members that there is criminal activity going on, that if they would disperse, if they're on this side of Jefferson, we want you to, to disperse here. If you're on this side of Washington, we want you to, to disperse here. One of the things that I heard in many of the public meetings that we had after the Trump protest was the fact that community members didn't identify that when they saw the tactical response unit line that something was going on. So that it would just be one way to further define what action and activity is happening, most specifically when it's criminal action and activity, so that our community members can disperse safely. Okay, but do, I don't hear anyone. Do you have any questions, Vice Mayor? Um, we have a motion on the floor. Roll call. I have a question about the motion. Um, are all, everything that we discuss and what we ask, is that going to be part of the motion? Mayor, uh, Councilman Pessor, just to clarify, what we, I think what we understood was the definition of weaponizing and Chief Williams gave an overview of what she would add into the policy for that. Okay. Was there something additional? 
the table, the table or the chart. The chart of, of sound. Of sound in the five seconds. Working and with the so, so we can work with, with the, the industrial high genesis. Yes. What I thought I heard you say, Councilwoman Pastor, is add that into the training function too when we're gonna do that. Well, yeah, I would want it in both, so it's very clear. <laughs> okay. So it's the motion as the recommendation to the council members. Mayor? Councilman Decisio is you Okay. Oh, thanks. Well, this is just in the comment stage. It's all it is. I totally get the idea and the debate of whether or not this is good policy, not good policy, whether it's the right instrument to do what it is we want to get done. But these things always digress into an anti-police <laughs> debate. And year, week after week, we hear the same discussion. Week after week, but by not challenging those viewpoints and saying that there's an alternative viewpoint out there that people do love our police. They appreciate the fact that they work hard. <laughs> we appreciate the fact that they give up their time and many times lose their lives. We accept as a city what they're saying. So at some point, I know I've been saying this every week, I'd like to hear others say we appreciate our police and we respect them and we think they're doing a good job out there. Because what ends up happening is by allowing that constant attack week after week after week, it becomes a form of acceptance that never should ever occur. And so I'm going to constantly push back. I am going to constantly say that, yes, we have sometimes problems, but we address those problems and that these men and women do an, an amazing job. They do an incredible job out there. And we need to start pushing back as a council on this rhetoric that's just not true, <laughs> it's false. No, you it's be quiet. Problem. You're out of order. It's a complete. Would, it's just would nothing but by, you by, please by leave the lies. By pushing lies, Mayor, because that's what they are, they're lies. By pushing those type of lies, then it becomes a level of acceptance over time. If you don't say, nope, that's just not true. <laughs> and so it's as simple as that. So from my end of it, I like, I appreciated the debate on this. I thought it was pretty interesting <laughs> and I thought it brought up some points, but this whole anti-police rhetoric is a bunch of BS and quite frankly, I'm gonna keep calling it out, Mayor. Thank you. I'm gonna be voting you. yes on this. Mayor, I'd like to make a comment. I would like to follow you and make it after your comment, please. Um, I just wanna make it known, I am not anti-police. I appreciate the men in blue, men and women in blue. Men, <laughs> I'm thinking of something else. And, um, and I also appreciate our community. And at the end of the day, Councilman, we are one community trying to survive in this world. And we have to come up with solutions that work for everybody. We may not like the solutions, but we need to keep Phoenix, the state, and the country safe. So I am not anti-police. And how dare you place that on any one of us? Thank you. Please. And additionally, oh, it, easily, this, if I can, First of all, I don't understand if I can just that add, it is not anti-police to want to ensure that we have accountability and clarity with regard to our policy. Just a few weeks ago, Councilman DeCicio asked about the department's use of camera at football games. I did not deem that anti-police. These are questions that need to be asked that address very valid community concerns. It's a concern for myself and for the district that I serve. Councilman DeCicio. Mayor? Yeah, clearly, I, you know, that's just a distraction which just occurred here. No one called anyone names up there. What I'm saying is that there are members out there in the public that come to us day to day, week to week, that are anti-police and they need to be addressed. And they need to be pushed back on because what they're saying is wrong. It's a lie. We know it's a lie. And excuse me for being direct because that's what I am. But at the end of the day, if we don't start saying, nope, that's just not true, we're not violent. We have good men and women that support our police, uh, we have, or that are great, they protect our public, then that's the problem. So that, all that other stuff is a distraction. Thank you. I'm going to uh, call for the vote. Decisio? Yes. Okay. Guevara? If I just explain my vote, I want to say I appreciate the police department's willingness to engage on the police policy governing this device. 
I think because of the drafts of the policy were available to the public and council members, we ended up with a better policy. Hearing from the public on this issue gave us a better policy. And I hope we can think about how to better involve the public in policy development, including police policy, but I don't think we've gotten far enough. There's language in this policy that after today's meetings seems to be meaningless, and so ultimately I can't support this. I think we have repeatedly heard from our constituents come to, who come to these meetings and ask for a different approach and ask for us to focus on building trust. So I am a no. Mendoza. I have a question. Is the motion including uh, the language that Councilwoman Pastor yes. added? Yes. Okay, I'll be a yes. Nowakowski. Uh, Mayor, I'm gonna be supporting this as long as it's gonna be used as a tool to not a weapon. And also that we have the policy that the comments that are my colleagues up here mentioned that needs to be put in there. And also if we make sure that there's only 15 police officers that are gonna be trained and they're the only individuals that can actually use this tool. And that we are gonna use, use it as a way where it's gonna be alert tones coming out first and then a message um, notifying the crowd what's what's happening and if they need to d disperse or not. Please. Thank you. Go on. Pastor? Please be quiet. I, add, I would like to add to the motion, so who is the motion maker? Uh, uh, Jim. I would like to add uh, a yearly review of the LRAD. Is it too late to add that since some have already voted? Mayor, members of council, you'd have to go back and re-vote on that. But okay. yes, it could be added, I suppose, at this point with the okay. consensus of the council. I just will have faith that. Okay, we will allow that to be included and start over with Councilman DeCicio. Okay. Councilman DeCicio? Yes. Councilwoman Guevara? Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. That brings us to uh, item 100, I believe. Do we, it's, yeah. Eight zero. Who was the other? Yeah. I was oh, gonna seven say one. Other. I'm sorry. Seven one. Seven one. I was wondering that myself. Uh, do we have a cards on 100? Move to approve item 100. Leonard Clark, are you still here? Please. Um, my name is Leonard Clark, and I believe this is on um, the water tanks. I think it's very good that we're doing this. Um, I hope that you'll vote for it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do, pardon me? Okay. We have a motion and a second to approve. Roll a call. DeCicio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. I believe it's item 120, 119. It's oh, it's the public hearing on it. We have cards on that too. I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone here that wishes to speak on amending the downtown code land use matrix? Here you see no one. I'll close the meeting. You want to tell us what your recommendation is? Sure, Mayor, members of council. Item 119 is a request to amend the downtown code land use matrix to allow for a tattoo body piercing studios within the Evans Churchill East character area in the downtown code. This request was approved by the Central City Village Planning Committee 16 to 0, the Planning Commission 7 to 0. The Planning Economic Development Subcommittee heard this item earlier in October and they recommend approval by a four to zero vote. Staff does recommend approval per the Planning and Economic Development Subcommittee recommendation and adoption of the related ordinance. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Hearing none, do we have a motion? Motion to approve per Planning and Economic Development Subcommittee recommendation and adopt the related ordinance. I'll second, second that, Mayor. Okay, we have a motion second, roll call. DeCicio? 
Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Item 120. Do we need a staff report, a brief staff report on this? Mayor, members of council, I believe item 120 and 121, we have uh, cards that are in support on this item. Right. So I will just read a brief paragraph. I do have a PowerPoint uh, okay. prepared if anyone wants that, but I think we can get through it with just the, the, the basics of these two cases. Well, I was going to have a staff report and then declare the public hearing open. Okay. So if you would like to... So, Mayor, members of Council, item 120 is a general plan amendment. This is uh, approximately 400 feet west of the northwest corner of 19th Avenue and Van Buren Street. This is a request uh, to change the general plan la uh, land use designation for a 1.76 acre parcel uh, to allow for residential development. The Central City Village Planning Committee voted 11 to 0 to approve it. Uh, the Planning Commission also voted 7 to 0 to approve it. The related case is the zoning case that goes with it, and that is a request to go from A1 and C3 Capital Mall Overlay District to R4 and R4 Capital Mall Overlay District to allow the multifamily residential development. Uh, the Central City Village Planning Committee approved that also by the 11 to 0 vote and Planning Commission by a 7 to 0 vote. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Hearing none, I'm going to open the public hearing. Mayor, just to clarify, you're opening the public hearing on both items 120 and 121? Yes. Perfect. I have one card that says neutral, Blas Cullen. Did you want to speak? Guess not. Um, the other card does not want to speak. Is there anyone else that wants to address the council on this item? None, I will close the meeting, the hearing. <laughs> Motion to approve for the Planning Commission recommendation and adopt the related resolution. Second that, Mayor. And that's on item 120, correct, Vice yes. Mayor? Yeah. Any comments? Hearing none, roll call. Decisio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Mayor. Can I go ahead and just make the motion? Thank you. Yeah. Motion to approve for the Planning Commission recommendation and adopt the related ordinance. Second that. Motion second. Any questions? Hearing none, roll call. Decisio? Decisio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Bring them to item, uh, can we do 22 and 23 together? Yes, Mayor, we can. Item 122 uh, and 123 are related for the same site. Item 122 is a general plan amendment request, GPA DV 1-18-2. This parcel is located approximately 3,300 feet north of the northeast corner of Black Canyon Highway and Joe Max uh, Road. This request is to change the general plan uh, land use designation for this parcel from uh, Commerce Park to residential for a 20.54 acre parcel. The uh, Deer Valley Village Planning Committee recommended approval seven to zero. The Planning Commission recommended approval by a six to zero vote. The related uh, zoning case, which is item 123, is a request to go from Commerce Park, General Commerce Park, uh, and Commerce Park with a special permit, uh, and S1 to R3 to allow for multifamily residential development for the 19.74 acre site. It was approved by the same uh, margins per an addendum staff report, uh, seven to zero at the planning com or the village planning committee, and then six to zero at the planning commission. With that, staff is happy to answer any questions. Not hearing it, I will open the public hearing on this. I have one card. Uh, Ray Brennan, did you want to speak? Okay. That's the only card I have. Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to speak? I will close the hearing. Motion to approve for the Planning Commission recommendation and adopt the related resolution. Second. Roll call. Decisio? Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. One Can I go ahead and do one yes, point Okay. Motion to approve for the Planning Commission recommendation and adopt the related ordinance. Second. Roll call. Decisio? 
Yes. Guevara? Yes. Mendoza? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Uh, I believe the next item is a resolution. Let's say citizen petition. Right. That 124 got pulled out. No, yeah. 124 and 125 were continued, right? Yeah. So it brings us to 126, a citizen's petition. I have a card, Leonard Clark. Hello, Mayor and Council. Um, thank you. My name is Leonard Clark. I was uh, just a confused. Uh, I didn't know if the people who are presenting the petition are supposed to speak before me or they already presented. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure. I didn't want to be rude and speak before them. Well, uh, I'm hoping that you will consider their petitions. I know that you are in many ways constricted by law. I can't remember the exact proposition about lowering the property values of property owners. But uh, this is a special case, and I'm hoping somebody from uh, our brothers and sisters or one of you would consider thinking of drafting some type of letter to the uh, state legislature, which is going to be coming into session very soon in January. I'm not sure if it's the second week of January, Monday, second Monday. So maybe Doug Ducey, if you're listening, you are supposed to be benevolent and moderate. Why not reach a handout to our Chinese American community? Maybe you could work with him. And also, I know my conservative friends won't like this, but how about working with the United Nations? I think that this is a special case. Um, it's not written in stone. It really isn't that a cultural site, something that is almost sacred uh, to uh, a group of people in our community here in the city of Phoenix, the fifth largest city in the United States of America, that it has to be 50 years old. Uh, it is several decades in age, and uh, it, you know, I believe this is how we can start mending this divide between the government that is supposed to represent us and the people and the cynicism that we have. So I ask you, please support these petitions, not only of our Chinese American brothers and sisters, but our allies, myself being one, who believe to preserve this valuable cultural site from the beautiful country of China, uh, ancient civilization, let us send out the message that we are working for that diversity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Charles Kung. Yeah, I was asked if I'm in favor or against it. I just want to make it clear that I wanted these center art pieces to be preserved. So whatever the motion that you think it is, that's what I wanted to do. The language, I haven't seen the motion if there's anything so it's hard to put a position. But that said, basically, there's three questions in front of us. One is, are these public arts? The officers from the city seems to be saying that because the city did not put a particular dollar amount into it, it cannot be treated as a public art. But that's not quite right. The citizens of Phoenix has been using these art enjoying these artworks for over 15 years. So these are public arts, and these are what people appreciated, and the kids went there for their school uh, projects. So these are public arts, that's one thing. The other thing that guarantees the public arts are this council, particular council, has voted several times with zoning stipulations. Each time a new building uh, groups was introduced, these were used as a public art projects that satisfy the public art requirements. So that's public art part. And the other one is, does city has a jurisdiction over these? Yes, city has lots of jurisdiction over it. All city has to say is we wish the new owner to protect these artworks, and we wish new owner to work with the Chinese community to protect these. And now the third question is, is city liable for any damages of these? As I understand, there are two pending lawsuits that city is part of the, uh, the, the party that is not dismissed by the court. So if these were destroyed, 
city, I think, is liable for the destruction because they gave the permit to the company to destroy the roof, and they gave the permit for the temporary fence a couple of times. So the evidence is very clear. So you may want to do something before all is done, all is destroyed. Thank you. Your report. Mayor, we have staff who can answer those questions about public art and the permits and the liability, but those were, I think the petition show those were the, really the questions that were asked. I'm not sure that there is a motion to be made by the council suggested, and so we have no suggested motion. The council's not obligated to make a motion in this case. You have the reports from staff and can do with those as you choose. I, I, I didn't get your card. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Come on. Elizabeth? Okay. Thank you all for the opportunity. I feel now I know all of you. I, I admire the hard work you're doing. I know you have a tough job here. I, uh, I kind of like a historian in this project. And I read your deputy city manager's comments. And I, I don't think that's correct. I want to tell you this is not the Chinese Cultural Center issue. This, we are here to decide the fate of the city's public art program and a challenge the city's reputation and the city's administrative ability on its own regulations. Should the council allow its administrative department to destroy its own public art, like Chinese Cultural Center, the council is to gonna set precedence in the destroying its own rules and regulations and its zoning authority. This one, so jurisdiction, you say you have no jurisdiction. You don't own my house. You have jurisdiction over me. You have no money to pay for to build the arts, but you have jurisdiction to control, make sure I build the way it is. You have jurisdiction to make sure the other person keep it. Because this is, a, I, build, I put $3 million on this 26 acres land. The medical center, the apartments, the hotel were allowed to build to the maximum zone square footage because the Chinese Cultural Center met its requirement. I talked to David Rickard, and he's the planning director. He told me he was surprised to find out fire dis the file disappeared. I couldn't believe it. I went to the city website. I can tell you many files are disappeared. So city need to do something. I knew your council, I voted for you, and I knew you can do your job. And I hope I have more than two minutes. I, I'm willing to tell you what I know, and I probably can point to the direction there's something there is wrong. And this is a public art. Public art is not city art, but it is public art. Public build for public. So this is how city can grow. Rather than worry about $1.2 million, you have to give someone to do that. If you want a city to grow, you cannot have all the budgets to pay for all the future public arts. So you, if you let this public arts disappear, many developers will agree to whatever you want to build their projects and someday they can just destroy it and build something else. So please investigate this. This is a public art program. My petition wants you to confirm that. And I, don't, I disagree with the city deputy manager's recommendation, and I have a proof to show you that. I hope we work together with the, the city as we are a new city. We are so busy. I know you're also too busy. I've been here long, longer probably than some of you. I've been here, I developed this project 22 years ago. I have some information I can share with you. It is public art program built according to the guideline of your 1988 March 16 uh, public art program adopted by the city council. Okay, thank you very much. And I'd be glad to ask question or answer your question if you allow me to. I gave you the other two cards time. I think that's what you meant when you said you were speaking for them. Great, thank okay. you so much. Okay. So you have about two minutes left. Thank you so much, I appreciate that, okay. I, I've, I love this communication chance. You know, I'm a very private person. 
And now I'm, I have a little more confidence in the city, and I want to hope you don't think Chinese community are nuisance. First of all, there are few confusions. Is this Chinese com community problem or is it a city problem? I think this is a city issue. This public art was not built for Chinese. I built a Chinese cultural center for Phoenix to proudly own its Chinatown as the fifth largest city. That's why I work with the city. If you could find out, building this Chinese cultural center is historical events. So I hope you, you, I could share with you all the photos, how city participated from the very beginning. Number two, the jurisdiction issue. I still want a city manager, city attorney, and a city council people think about your jurisdiction. You have the jurisdiction to make sure every rule you made should stay. Nobody should just forget. I know you have so many things happening, but I think right now you, your argument for jurisdiction, you have no jurisdiction over, over the arts I contributed, is wrong. You have, I built it according to your regulation, and you have control and to make sure those things stay, and I won't just agree and tomorrow I disappear. So this is your jurisdiction, you need to think that. And also the city will never have money, enough money to create the city with all the arts program. You have to use this developer like me. And you are setting the precedence for developer in the future to apply to the zoning, agree with your terms. And after they got what they want, they're gonna destroy whatever they agree to you. There's a contract binding between this developer and the city. I develop my part. City now, you have a rise over this contract. Don't say you have, cannot have a file. You have the file. I want all the council members to understand. Check your website right now, your link. Good thing is I printed it out, some of the stuff. Now I cannot find out some of the files recently. Please check your link. Somebody is manipulating you. your file. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do have one question, uh, Brad. Isn't there something in the charter or council rules that one council cannot bind another one? Um, Mayor, members of council, we could talk about that in executive session, but the, the bottom line here is I don't think that issue comes to play with respect to this public art issue, and I think the art issue is analyzed very well in the, um, in the report. council report. Right. The, the bottom line is, is that if we could have in those days set requirements for public art in a private project, we didn't actually do that, but applied that kind of concept on an ad hoc basis to some projects. Today we couldn't probably do that under Prop 207. Right. So that's the, the problem we face. I understand. So what file, what documentation is missing? So Many we, documentation. And, and how did it disappear, I guess? <laughs> I'm asking so, Ellen, I believe. Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, the department has records from the zoning case that started in 1988. There were several amendments through that case, um, but there are uh, other records that are site planning ones that aren't legally binding property records that the city disposes of pursuant to state law. Um, you don't, you, you have to keep things for seven years, I believe is the, is the time line, and so we keep things and they're up to that point, but then other things, um, now we do scan more stuff in, but other times back then we didn't keep uh, everything. And I think part of what they're really referencing is what uh, came about at the time in the, the late 80s, there was council discussion about coming up with uh, zoning requirements to put art in private development that was visible to the public. And that's really what this is. Uh, the zoning stipulation that's on here does not reference any type of specific Chinese art. It says you have to have art. And in fact, it was on that parcel prior to the Chinese uh, Cultural Center even becoming a conception or idea on that parcel. It was placed on in the 1988 zoning case when it was a, a request for C2 mid-rise zoning. So if you think of a lot of the high-rise and mid-rise development, they all have some type of public plaza, lots of them have artwork, benches, other things. That was the vein that that requirement came into, into being on. When the Chinese Cultural Center came into being and when Ms. Mann and others brought that forward, 
they proposed to include the, the Chinese element as part of creating the cultural center to satisfy that stipulation. They modified other stipulations to do their site plan that they wanted to do as opposed to what was originally proposed, but they did not modify that. They said, here's how we'll meet that SIP, it's the artwork. And so what staff has consistently told uh, the current owner is you have to have artwork on that site to comply with that stipulation or you have to go back through a public hearing process. And so that's the requirement that they have to, to meet and staff will enforce that as they continue to, to work on this issue. Do we know if they're gonna go through a public hearing process or are they gonna maintain the artwork or what do we know? Uh, well, Mayor, Councilwoman uh, Pastor, the applicant has indicated in prior discussions, uh, I think at one point they were trying to donate the art to the Hans Park and also make a monetary contribution to create some type of Chinese garden or, or some element there as part of Hans Park. So they have, uh, at that point, at least indicated that they wanted to have some different type of artwork. I have not had any discussions with them more recently uh, about this issue because it is involved in multiple private lawsuits between the, the private property uh, owners, uh, and that's principally what this issue is. Okay, thank you. Any Can I say questions? something? No, I'm sorry. Okay. Any other council questions? Hearing none, we're going to be adjourned. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, I thought we just did that. Mayor, there, there are two petitions. Right. Oh. I guess I'm in a rush to get home tonight for some reason. I'm sorry. Is it George Papa? Honorable Mayor, Council, staff, my name is George Papa and I rise in support of preserving the Chinese Cultural Center. But I wish to clarify something. This is more than just a Chinese Cultural Center. This is an icon for the community. It's irreplaceable. It, uh, I'm honored to follow Mrs. Elizabeth Mann who was the developer for 26 acres. She followed all the rules and regulations including the inclusion of art. And she actually did a spectacular job. She born and raised in China, made 40 trips back and forth in a period of one year to bring wonderful artisans, material, to recreate an authentic Chinese community center. And I stand now before you to offer a solution that has not been officially talked about before, but I, we've discussed it. And I think everybody will be happy with this. It is a win-win situation for everybody. And it has to do with the city of Phoenix putting into motion a eminent domain condemnation in reverse. Usually a piece of property is condemned so that a freeway can be built, so that the property can be demolished. Now, of course, this is by appraisal and this, this is by consent by all parties. Because of the iconic situation and the value culturally, uh, artistically of this particular center, I can tell you that there are numerous investors with vast liquidity who are capable and have actually put it in writing and they can close an escrow in 30 days with cash to buy that property to save it unto themselves for perpetuity and what would be beneficial, I, I know the True North people, I know their council, uh, I'm happy to go to them. We've attempted to do so in the past to make an, uh, 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 an agreeable purchase, but it has uh, for some reason been rebuffed if there was the extra caveat that the city would consider a condemnation, so to put into motion an actual appraisal of the property uh, and a forced sale for the preservation, uh, that would be beneficial in terms of creating leverage to create that reality. And I would like to have some discussion as to whether or not the city council would consider such a maneuver. Um, Brad, we have certain 
police powers and one is condemnation, but it's routinely used for public purpose, correct? That's correct. So I, I'm not sure this would be a public purpose. When I think of public purpose, I think of roads, trying to purchase property for a police station or a fire station. Correct. That's correct, um, Councilwoman, yes. I, I think we'd be going down a dangerous path. We might abuse our power of condemnation if we looked at this, just my opinion. I would simply say that uh, this is an exception and it's worthy of consideration due to, as I said, its historical value, its irreplaceable value, its art value. Uh, if that goes, it will never be replaced. So, Mayor, members of council, of course, if there are people willing to buy the property, they can do that on a private negotiation basis. To the extent that they want us to as, act as their leverage, that would be illegal and an abuse of our police power. We couldn't do that. Mayor Councilman Stark, the, the, it's the Bailey's Break Shop case, and that's the decision that, that in Arizona you can only use condemnation authority for a direct public purpose. And so the city would have to own that, use that as some type of public facility. Um, otherwise, you cannot you're, use your eminent You're correct. Authority. I'm also thinking, though, the case in, I think it was Connecticut. Where, oh, the Kelo uh, decision, yeah. Uh, Supreme Court Justice Clint Bullock represented um, a neighborhood on economic development condemnation. I'm, that's how mm -hmm. I tie it back to Arizona. Is there any further discussion? Can you put these in the record, please? I think we've um, had full discussion on the site and, and the response from staff, so. Council have any other questions, comments? I'm going to adjourn the meeting. <laughs>